Welcome back. So in part two, we're going to talk about how the US got here. Now, I'm going to spend the rest of this presentation talking about how the US got here, uh, this massive $35 trillion of debt, the three choices that the US has, and the very three different effects it will have on your portfolio, depending on what choice the US makes. So George Washington said debt is the greatest slavery. And if we look at the left there, we can see how the US government debt has evolved over the years. It started in the 60s, pretty negligible, had a bounce in the 80s, and then started growing exponential um, in the early 2000s. Now, the first national debt post-American uh, revolution was issued in 1790, ironically by then President George Washington, with a face value of $11.7 million. Over the next 200, and 24 years, from 1790 to 2014, that debt has totaled $17.5 trillion. That's 224 years. Over the next 10 years only, from 2014 to 2024, that US debt doubled uh, to another $17.5 another $17 trillion to $35 trillion. So how did the US get here? Well, for starters, the US spends more money every year than what they earn. And this uh, is termed a deficit, and this deficit is funded by debt. So to look at a practical example, or a recent example of, of, of how a budget deficit occurs, let's look at the March budget for 2024, the US's budget. We can see on the left uh, the total revenue for March for US as a government, which is almost by exclusively from tax receipts, was $332 billion. Now everything to the right, which, and which is in red, is total expenses, and total expenses totaled $566 billion. This left a shortfall, or a deficit, of $234 billion. And this debt, this deficit, sorry, was funded by debt. Now I think it's worth noting here that the total revenue of $332 could only barely cover the three mandatory spending categories of social security, income security, and national health. It couldn't cover anything else. It couldn't cover the category of interest expense, of defense, of Medicare, of transport, of construction, etc. So the very important point I want to make here is the US had to issue new debt, that $234 billion, to cover the interest expense on its existing debt. And this is a red flag for us. I mean, if I think of it in a day-to-day -day life, and for me and you, in context, imagine if you had a credit card and you max that out this month, and you now have to pay the interest on that credit card, but you've got no more money, you're then going to get another credit card. You're going to put up debt on that credit card just to pay off the interest on the first credit card. Obviously, that second credit card is going to get maxed out over time, and then you're going to need a third credit card to pay off the interest on the first and the second uh, uh, credit card. And remember, this is just the interest, not the principal payment. Now, deficits aren't new to the US. They've been around since at least the 60s. The last budget surplus was in 2001. Since then, the US has had uninterrupted budget deficits, and some of them have been significant. What hasn't helped has been the financial shocks um, of the 9-11 and the wars that came after that, or the great financial crisis in 2008, and the financial bailouts that were required for that. And then the pandemic in 2020, which had helicopter money, which where the government gave money to to US citizens. What is very disturbing though is that even in 2023, which was a very good economic year for the US, GDP was strong, unemployment was very low, they ran a very massive deficit of $1.6 trillion. This should have been a year where they ran a surplus and paid down debt. Now, some very prominent people are sounding the alarm bell on the US government at debt levels. So looking at this, these six people, what are some of the similarities that, that you see when you're looking at these people? Well, number one, they're all very wealthy. Even Jerome Powell, he's worth between 100 and 200 million dollars. He was a partner at private equity group Carlyle uh, before he became Fed chair. The rest are multi-billionaires. The second similarity is that these are probably six of the most knowledgeable people in finance and investments today. At the top left, we've got Stanley Druckermiller probably one of the best macro uh, investors out there today. 
He says the US debt crisis is worse than I imagined. Next to him is Ken Griffin, the founder of Citadel, one of the more successful hedge funds out there. He says no one is planning for high interest rates, which is what we have now. On the bottom left, we've got uh, Ray Dalio, founder of Bridgewater, the world's largest hedge fund. He says America is facing a huge or big cycle debt crisis after an insanely free money environment. This refers to the long period um, in the probably the last 15 years of where we had almost zero or close to zero interest rates. Next to him, we have Larry Fink, who's the founder, chairman and CEO of BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world. And he says the US cannot take for granted that investors will continue to buy US debt in the same size and at the same price. And then we have Jerome Powell and Warren Buffett who agree when they say the US government's finances are unsustainable. So if these people are worried, I'm listening. Now, when we think about debt, debt is not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a good thing if used productively. And a clean and simple way to measure this is looking at the ratio of US debt to GDP. And a good measure would be seeing this ratio going down. Unfortunately for the US, this measure has been going up. In 2024, the ratio was 120%, uh, a level last seen, seen since the end of World War II. And the US's own Congressional Budget Office expects deficits to continue straight through to 2053 and for that ratio to reach 200%. Um, it's worth noting that the uh, forecasts that the CBO does use are conservative. There's no recessions in those forecasts and there's no pandemics or financial crises. Uh, before I go to the next slide, I just want you to notice that debt and debt to GDP came from very low levels and started creeping up from 1980 onwards. Here I'm showing the US's funding rates or borrowing rates. Uh, this is the rate at which the US government borrows money. Why am I showing you this slide? Well, you can have a lot of debt. Let's say you've got the $35 trillion of debt, but if your interest expense is zero, your interest payments will be zero. So then interest isn't really a problem. Um, now we can see the US has been quite fortunate because as debt levels started increasing from 1980, you can see that their borrowing rates came from a high from 1980 and started coming down. So as your debt went up, your interest rates came down and that sort of kept a lid on your total interest payments. However, as you can see on the left, as inflation started going up in 2022, interest rates started going up. And now you've got a problem because now you've got high debt levels and you're getting, starting to get higher interest rates. So what do you think happened to interest payments or interest expense? Well, they skyrocketed. The US is now currently spending a trillion dollars per year on interest payments alone. And to put this into context, this is the first time that the US is spending more on interest payments. And this is not on paying off interest uh, debt or the principal, but just on the interest. Um, this is the first time that they're spending more than they are spending on their def on entire defense bu budget. So this is another uh, red flag for us. So this brings us to what I'd like to call the debt cycle. The US government is spending more money on social security, income security, defense, and now interest, which is leading to larger deficits. Larger deficits need to be funded by more debt. All else being equal, more debt equals more inflation, as there's more money getting pumped into the system. Higher inflation causes the Federal Reserve to hike interest rates. High interest rates on debt equals larger interest expense. And because the US doesn't have money to pay that interest expense, they have to raise more debt. And more debt goes back into larger deficits. And so it goes on. So the US is in a very difficult place and is effectively trapped. Now, we're going to shift gears a bit here. And I'm going to, in the next four slides, I'm going to talk about the supply and the demand of US debt. Now bear in mind, once the debt is issued, once the US government has issued the debt, that debt changes hands and trades on public markets, much like a stock exchange, but for debt. So it's important to consider the supply and the demand of US debt. Now all outstanding, current outstanding US debt is going to mature sometime in the future, sometime between now and 30 years time. Some debt will mature in one month, five years, 10 years, etc., up to 30 years. Now, what, if you are the US government, you'd like to see a nice evenly distributed uh, maturity cycle, meaning that if you have a lot of debt, $35 trillion, you want to pay that off evenly over the next 30 years. Unfortunately for the US, 
its maturity profile doesn't look that good. Half of all its debt, outstanding debt, is due in the next two years. So that is a lot of debt that is coming up in a short time, uh, space of time, and that's what I'd refer to as the supply of debt. And this is coming, unfortunately, at a time when there's some big holders of US debt who have been reducing their holdings. If we look at China, for example, they used to be the biggest holders of US government debt, and they've been reducing their holdings since at least 2018, and more aggressively so since 2022. We can also see Brazil and Saudi Arabia have been reducing their debt. And this goes back to what Larry Fink was telling us from BlackRock, is that the US cannot take for granted that people will still want to buy their debt in the same size uh, and at the same price. And this will have consequences later. So we've got a lot of supply that's coming to market of US debt, whilst we have some uh, large holders of US debt which are reducing their holdings. Now, bear with me for a second when I show you this next slide. This looks at gold's relationship to US real rates. And that's been following, there's been quite a good relationship over the years, but that broke down in 2022. And that coincided with the Russian and Ukraine war. Shortly after that war started, the US imposed sanctions on Russia, effectively freezing all their foreign assets, including the, the Russia's US uh, debt assets. So this is an asset for Russia, and it is a debt that the US has owed Russia, along with the interest that it needs to pay on it. Now, if you, if you are China and you're looking at this from the outside and you're seeing that the US has frozen um, debt that it owes Russia, if you were China, would you be buying more US debt or would you be selling? And if you were selling, what would you be buying with those proceeds? And the answer is, in part, you'd be buying gold. China has been buying gold, as have the other central banks around the world. The Russian-Ukraine war started in quarter one in 2022. And after that, we can see how central banks around the world have significantly increased their buying of gold in 2022, 2023, and on track for a strong 2024. So to recap of what we've spoken about up to now, one, the US has too much debt, which is evidenced by the fact that they need to raise new debt just to pay the interest off on their existing debt. Two, they're running deficits, and the CBO expects them to continue running deficits. Running deficits means they need to fund that with debt, so they're going to have to have more debt on the current large size of debt. Number three, they're not using their debt proactively. And number four, there's a lot of supply of US debt that's coming to the market uh, in the next two years as a time, at a time when the demand profile is changing. So what is the path forward? So there's three ways forward. The US can cut debt. That would be the right thing to do but politically unpopular, as it will mean they need to cut into social spending, defense spending, uh, and other social services. They can do nothing and let the debt levels continue creeping up, as they have for the last couple of decades, and effectively kicking the can down the road. And then thirdly, there could be another financial crisis or another pandemic, such as COVID, where they need to issue uh, a lot more debt. Um, and now, all three of these scenarios will have three totally different effects on your portfolio. All right, let's leave that there for now and we'll be back later with part three.